Changes happen to all of us. All of life is about change. It's often been said the only constant in life is change. We're used to it. This year, 2020, has been a year filled with change for all of us, you know, from March until now. We went from freedom to lockdowns. We went from faces to face masks. We went from fist bumps and hugs and kisses to air hugs and elbow bumps at best. Uh, We went to having all the toilet paper we ever needed in our life to suddenly you have to count the squares at each time. So, and through those, we've made it. You and I have as Americans, the world has, the whole world's gone through with this pandemic thing. And those, we roll with those changes, kind of like one of those, okay, you live with it, you deal with it, you got to make the changes that you have to make. Those are part of life's experiences, you know, going out for dinner and then plans get changed or a practice gets changed or a game gets changed. That's all routine life. If your life isn't changing on a regular basis, you're dead. If you're alive, those kind of changes come along on a regular basis. But this message this morning is when God changes your life plan. When your life plans go from what you thought was going to be normal and average and ordinary to suddenly it stops you in your tracks. Those life changing, could this really be happening to me kinds of changes. Those are what I call life plan changes. They keep you awake. They make you sick. You get all worried. You get all anxious. It's like nothing you ever expected. And boom, there it is. And you have to deal with it. Now, that happens to us uh, a few times during the life journey, not always, but it does happen on a regular basis. When it does, when it's your first time, you go numb, you get all scared, you get shocked, you don't know what to do. And then after a few other times, you realize, okay, this is part of that, that journey that God has for me. Years ago, there used to be a little track out that said, God, has, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And that sounds really good. I mean, that's a feel-good message if ever you heard one. God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. I have learned to change that to God loves you, and he has an eternal plan for your life. God's eternal plan for your life, it's not always easy. It's not always fun. It's not always, oh, this is awesome. I mean, when Jesus was crucified, there was nothing fun about God's eternal plan for Jesus that day. When Stephen was being stoned to death just after preaching the good news, there was nothing fun and wonderful about him being stoned to death. When Paul's in prison and whipped and beaten and floating in the Mediterranean Ocean for a couple of days, he didn't say, oh, it's a wonderful plan, so let me get you to change it and say, God has an eternal plan for my life. It's not always easy or fun, but it's always eternal. Now, crowd with me in person and crowd online. I want you to say it together. We have to all say it together. If it's just me, it'll be awkward, okay? So all together with full voice. Ready, set, go. God has an eternal plan for my life. It's not always easy or fun, but it is always eternal. Are you with me on that? God has an eternal plan. He had it long before we ever existed, and he has it long afterwards. We spend our 70 or 80 years on this earth trying to find that that will, that plan. And when we do, we walk in it. It's not always easy, not always fun, doesn't always work out the way we think, but it is part of God's eternal plan, the good and the not so good as well. Now, of all the people in history, there is one person that is the absolute master of at dealing with massive life plan changes. I wish I could tell you that he was a PhD. I wish I could tell you he was a saintly person. I wish I could tell you that he loved the Lord with all of his heart, but all I know is that she was about 15 years of age, maybe give or take a year or two. She did love God. She was a good girl. She was not wealthy. She was not extremely smart. She was just living out a nice, normal, quiet life in Nazareth in the Holy Lands. She was engaged to get married to a boy that she probably knew and grew up with. And uh, while he's trying to get his family business going with his parents, she's doing her thing, minding her business, waiting for that day when it arrives that, you know, it's time to get married. Her name is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her life was going really, really well until he showed up. Her life was going really well. I always picture her dusting or working in the house or doing whatever 15-year-old girls do back then. And then he showed up. Now, when I say he, that would be Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. If you have your Bibles, open them to Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at that story today and learn a lesson or two from Mary and then see if we can follow her example. Luke chapter 1, 
And let's see. Where are you, Luke? Uh, there we go. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now, here's what I want you to get about Mary. She's doing her own thing. She loves the Lord. She's quiet. Everything is fine. Got her life figured out. It's going a certain direction. And then all of a sudden, he, which is Gabriel, shows up. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and he said, here's the NLT version, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. The more famous version is, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou amongst women. The Lord is with you and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus Christ. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners in our hour of need and in our times of death. Now, that's a big thing. Gabriel, he's been in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New. He was the messenger angel of God when God wanted to talk to human beings, and it was a really big deal. He sent Gabriel. Six months earlier, he'd sent him to a, a priest named Zechariah. He and his wife were old in age, couldn't have babies, way past the stage. And then all of a sudden, the angel appeared to, to Zechariah and said, hey, you're going to be a father and instead of saying, oh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, that's awesome news, uh, all Zachariah would say, well, no, there's no way that's going to happen. And Gabriel, you don't talk back to the angel of God. And Gabriel said to, to Zechariah, since you, he said, it will happen. I am the angel of the Lord. I stand in the presence of God and what I say will happen. And just so that you know it for a fact, you will be silent until your baby is born. And by the way, when he's born, call him John. And so all of a sudden his voice is gone. That was six months earlier. Six months later, Elizabeth, six months pregnant. Now Gabriel shows up to Mary and he says, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou amongst women. This is a life-changing moment. Then he goes on to tell her, he says, uh, confused and disturbed, she said, uh, was thinking to herself. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You'll conceive and give birth to a son. You'll name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now stop, look at me right now. Give me your undivided attention. I want you to go back in time to when you were 15 years old. All right, keep going, keep going. For some of you, it's a longer rewind than others. 15 years old. You're probably trying to get your, your learner's permit. You're trying your freshman or sophomore in high school. You're trying to figure your life out. And you're just trying to make it through school, get a girlfriend or a boyfriend, get your driver's permit. Those were the major events in your life. Now imagine an angel shows up to you one day and says, you are going to be the mother of God. Everything you imagined about your life suddenly came to a screeching halt. Now everything is totally focused on the eternal plan that God has for you. As a full-grown adult, we have a hard time dealing with these major life changes. Imagine a 15-year-old girl. That's why I say Mary is the absolute queen of dealing with major life changes in our lives. Whenever one rolls into your life again, follow what Mary did, and I promise you, you will get the results that Mary got. Now, Mary says, you know, she's shocked and the angel's kind of trying to downplay it because Gabriel's figuring out humans aren't quite as, you know, when you're used to seeing angels and God and glory and then you're on earth talking to regular people, just showing up. Uh, back then, if you saw an angel at all, you figured it was your time to die and they came to take you away. So that's why Mary goes, oh, what's going on? And so he just calms her down a little bit <laughs> and tries to set her at ease by saying, you are gonna be the mother of God. Oh, doesn't that just set your mind at ease? Oh, whew, for a second, I thought it was going to be something serious. Oh, sure, bring it on. That's where we are in life, when those major changes come. Now, the things that Mary did are the things that we need to do too. So I want you to write these down, mark them. If you need them today, use them. If you don't, my prayer is that God will put somebody in your life this week or the next. It'll go, I can't believe what just happened. I don't know what to do. You say, you know, it's funny, but the Lord gave me a message and here it is. Number one on the list, thank through the shock. Let me hear you say, thank through the shock. Now with Mary, she says, confused and disturbed. He says, don't be afraid. And uh, she's trying to figure it all out. He said, uh, and then her thing is, Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am still a virgin. You got to think 
through the shock. The initial, oh, oh, that's going to happen to everybody. There is not a soul on earth that gets a major life decision that handles it with just, oh, that's awesome. The Lord is good. They always say it that way six months or a year after it's happened. Have you noticed that? When you're walking through it, it's the end of the world. And as you get through it, you go, okay, and you learn to deal with it. You got to think through the shock. Now, whether it's a breakup with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, could be a divorce, could be a total career change, could be a life change. You could have been passed over for your promotion in the military and suddenly at 25 or 35 or 40, your career there is over and you're just getting started. Those are all major life changes. You're taking a shower, you feel a little bump or a knot, and you think, oh, it's nothing. It gets a little bigger, a little bigger. You go to the doctor. They say, oh, I'm sure it's nothing, but let's do a biopsy anyway. And then they call you and say, well, can you come in? And like all of us, can you just tell it to me on the phone? And the answer is no. Sorry, we got to come in. Oh, man. And so you go in and say, well, I'm afraid we got bad news. It is this or that. And suddenly you hear the cancer word and your life is changed. You're pregnant, you're so excited, it just, you've never been pregnant before, and you and your husband dreaming for having that little baby girl or little baby boy, and it just is wonderful, but it seems bigger than other people's at your age and stage. You go to the doctor, and he or she says, hey, we've got some great news for you. What is the news? You're going to have triplets. <laughs> There's your life change. <gasps> Triplets? No. Which ones? Uh, suddenly your world stops. Now, when that happens to you, and it will happen again before your life is over, when there's that, what do I do? Do what Mary did. You stop, you think through it. You take a deep breath after the initial shock. Oh, okay, what does this mean? You're going to stay up. You're going to get sick in the stomach. However you respond to stress is your method and your style. But I'm telling you, you have to think through it. You have to reason through, wait a second, what does this mean? If it's a life change, if it's a career change, if it's a relationship change, if somebody, a loved one close has died, all of those things are big, earth-shaking, life-changing moments. Uh, several years back, my dad was 71, healthy and young and just retired, and was living life. And one summer, he was, uh, started turning kind of yellow. He went to get his eyes checked, and the eye doc said, Harry, you don't need to go to the eye doctor. You need to go see the, you know, his other doc. So he did. Ends up, goes to the hospital, gets biopsied. And uh, I remember my mother and I would go in. The, he was still asleep in recovery. My mom were in there and I were there. He, the doctor walks in and he says that, oh, I hate that word. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. He said, uh, you know, Harry, my father, your husband, your father. He said he has uh, late stage pancreatic cancer. And when you hear that, oh, we all we kind of grew up medically. And uh, we all knew what pancreatic cancer was. And what do we do? Well, we go through the... But it was that initial... <sighs> your body just sings. Here's your, your dad, young and healthy and alive. And of all the things, he gets that. And that night, I remember we didn't sleep. We talked. We looked down the road. I remember talking about the road to come. And my mother said, I don't... That, she said, that's a dark forest. And I don't want to walk there right now. So I said, okay, mom, we'll just back it up. Whatever your experience is, I promise you, it'll hit you like just, it'll shock you out of your life. It'll shock you out of your sleep. It'll make you wonder, am I even doing the right things? Why would this happen to me? You got to sit down. You got to pray. You got to read the Psalms. You got to get a notebook or pencil and you say, okay, Lord, here are the pros and cons. Here's what's happened. You got to think through the shock. Let me hear you say it. Think through the shock. As you're thinking through it, the next step is you've got to ask the Lord for next, your next step. Look what Mary does. She says, uh, how can this happen? I am a virgin. She's asking the angel questions. Now, when Zechariah asked that, uh, he got shut up for nine months. When Mary asked it, I'm, I'm thinking Gabriel's showing a little favoritism. I mean, she's a little cute little 15-year-old girl. She's just been shocked. The other guy was an old preacher. He ought to know better. But the young 50, well, how's this going to happen to me? I'm okay. You know, and so he, say, he explains it. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The baby will be born holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, I love this, verse 36. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Now, Mary's asking, what, what do I do? And then basically, Gabriel says, relax. The Lord will take care of the details. You don't have to do a thing. But then he goes, also, your relative, your cousin Elizabeth, she's six months pregnant. Now, I'm almost positive everybody in the region 
knew about Elizabeth being pregnant. It was big news when somebody that's old and righteous and godly suddenly has a baby and is showing. So that's big news. But what Gabriel is doing is giving Mary her next step. I'm going to tell you, Mary, God is going to take care of the details. You don't have to do anything. You found favor with God. He's going to take care of the details. But in essence, Gabriel is saying, but you might want to go talk to Elizabeth. She can relate to you. She can share her story with you. You will find comfort and strength there. And that's all he says. Nothing is impossible with God. I've shocked you. Your life is changing. But I want to tell you there is a next step. Your cousin Elizabeth will help get you through the process. Second idea we have to lock into is we've got to ask the Lord for next steps. When that initial shock hits, <gasps> And we go, oh, the next thing is, well, Lord, what do I do? What's next? God always reveals the next step, never the whole plan. Who, man, I wish I had thought of that sooner. We could have had a slide. I just have to say it again, all right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a living thing, these sermons. So here it is. God always reveals the next step, never the whole plan. And every human being on earth wants to know the whole plan. And God never tells a soul the whole plan. God reveals the next step. We take that step. He shows us the next one. He shows us the next one. But he never gives us the whole plan at once. Can you imagine what would have happened if Gabriel had told Mary everything? Mary, you're going to have the, the son of God. That's awesome. Your cousin Elizabeth, she's already six months pregnant. Go talk to her. Okay. And you're going to be with her for about three months. When you come back to Nazareth, that's when you're going to tell Joseph the rest of the story. Because he doesn't know anything at this point. And Joseph is going to, though he loves you, nobody's buying the story. And he's going to divorce you quietly. A little 15-year-old girl, my, my fiance, she, he says, yes, but don't worry. I'll talk to him in a dream. I'll fix all of that. <gasps> okay, it be, yeah, it'd be all fine. After that, you'll be fine. Oh, by the way, everybody in town will look down on you because you're showing more and more, and nobody is buying the God story. But that's all right because it's God's plan. Not always easy, not always fun, but always eternal. Oh, and Mary, the good news, when you're nine months pregnant, you get to ride a donkey 90 miles to Bethlehem. <laughs> and this, you're going to camp out along the road. You're going to get into Bethlehem. It'll be late at night. And there's no room in the inn. There's no hotels.com. There's no Airbnb. And you are going to have a baby, the son of God, in the barn there in Bethlehem. How many of you are mothers in the house today? Raise your hand. Okay. I want you to imagine when you were nine months pregnant... And your husband putting you on a donkey and walking you to, was it Weldon or Walden? How do you pronounce it? Walden. Walden. So you're riding a donkey up Cameron Pass to Walden, about 90 miles. How are you feeling about that part of the plan? That's why God always gives us the next step, never the whole plan. Oh, and Mary, after that, the king is going to try to kill your son. You're kidding. Don't worry. I'm going to take you to Egypt for a few years. It'll be Egypt. I've never been. Well, then I know, but you're going to come back. And then that 12 year old charming son of yours is going to, you know, leave for three days and pull the stunt of a middle school lifetime. But you're going to find him. And eventually, you know, bad things happen, but good things come. God always reveals the next step. <laughs> but he never reveals the whole plan. And aren't you glad? If God revealed his whole plan to us, man, we would back off and kick. We wouldn't say like uh, Mary did, be it unto me according to the Lord's will. If she knew the whole plan, I guarantee you she wouldn't have said, be it unto me according to the Lord's will. But God revealed just enough to her to say, this is what's happening. And she says, okay, I'm in. And she takes the next step. Third thing that we learned from Mary is you got to act on it. Let me hear you say act on it. So we, we think through the shock. And then we say, Lord, what is the next step? Do I go see somebody? Do I read a book? Do I talk to a friend? Do I talk to a counselor? Do, what do I do? That's, that's that plan part. That's the step. And when God shows it to you, then you take that step. Mary, it says, said, be an enemy according to the Lord's will. And then verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. Zechariah said nothing. 
because he couldn't. Remember, he was shut up for nine months for being faithless, so I'm sure Elizabeth enjoyed those nine months. Every, every pastor's wife knows what I'm talking about. They're a pastor's husband. I mean, you having to listen to sermons every week, so he was silent. Anyway, that's more than you needed to know about verse 40. At the sound of her, Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. This is four days ago, three days ago. And already, she already has insight from the Spirit. Your child is blessed. And Elizabeth said, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped, for you were blessed because you believed the Lord would do what he said. You are blessed because by faith you took the next step and the next step and the next step. And the angel gave her the step was, look, go see Elizabeth. She gets there, and without saying anything, Elizabeth is already in charge and saying, I can't believe this is happening. I can hear her now. Honey, go unpack your bag. Sit down. We got a lot to talk about in the next few months. <gasps> well, that, yeah, yes, with Zachariah, he said the same thing. And, then, and when did you know you were pregnant? Well, when, you know, just when I threw up. <laughs> I forgot. Did he tell you about that part of the? No, he didn't. Okay, that's good. One step at a time. And they sat there for three months. Elizabeth, six months pregnant, cannot believe what has happened in her life. Because as a righteous woman, if you didn't have children, it was considered a curse from God that you had some secret sin in your life. So for the first time in her life, God's plan goes, wow, and she has that joy. And then Elizabeth, Mary on the far, other far end at 15, for the first time in her life, goes, I don't believe my life plan has changed entirely. And those two talk about it for three months. And then it says that Mary went back home to Nazareth, and that's when she told Joseph. When you read Matthew chapter 1 and 2, you know, Matthew condenses the whole thing in a couple of verses. And it looks like she gets pregnant, and then she has a conversation with Joseph, and he has upset. That was a much longer conversation. I am almost certain Mary did not tell Joseph before she left in two or three days to go see Elizabeth. Oh, by the way, Joseph, saw an angel the other day. You and I are going to be the parents of the Son of God. If you were 15 and in your right mind, would you say something like that? No. She's not going to tell Joseph. I mean, he's 16, maybe 17 himself. Mary's just trying to think through this whole process. And she goes and she acts and she goes to Elizabeth. Doesn't tell anybody I'm pregnant. I've talked to an angel or anything like that. That's why it was so incredible when she knocks on the door of Elizabeth's house and Elizabeth does that. Ah, oh, what am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord should come here and visit? You know what's going on, Elizabeth? <laughs> oh, honey, I know what's going on. We're going to have a long talk. And so for three months they did. And then Mary left and went back to Nazareth. Now, for $100, why would Mary leave after three months with Elizabeth? You said, you said that? Oh, there you go. All right, I owe Julie $100. <laughs> what happened was, you know, cousin Elizabeth, who was six months at the beginning of the visit, was now nine months. Wah, she's baby. And I'm sure Elizabeth says, honey, you need to go before we go into this, this process. It'll scare you out. So she goes back home. And she talks to Joseph, and of course he does the things. Good man, going to divorce her quietly. And then the angel Gabriel appears to him in a vision and says, Hey, what she told you is true. Go ahead and do his story. We'll look at it next week. But this week is how do you get through those major life changes? You think through it. You ask God for the next step, not the whole plan. And then you act on whatever it is he gave you. I'm standing here today having lived that out. In fact, Julie Penta and I both have lived this out. All of us have, but hers and mine are kind of fresh. About three months ago, the Lord made it clear to Julie that she was supposed to step down from being the lead pastor and the founding pastor of uh, the Grove Church. And she woke up and she had a couple of sleepless nights and that wrestling with God and thinking through that whole process. She talks to Joseph, she talks to Billy, the district superintendent for our churches, and, and she thinks through it and works through it, but it's that, wait a second, you're in the prime of your life, the church is going well, everything is good, why would God do this? We don't know God's plan. We know it's eternal, we know it's not always easy, it's not always fun, but when he gives it to us, then we say, well, Lord, what do I do next? And she followed those next steps. And the process of doing that journey, she's uh, much better at it than I am, although I've gotten better the older I get. 
But she obeyed what God told her to do. And so today she's worshiping and she got the fun of coming in, just being the happy mother and wife. Oh, that's my husband leading worship and got the little people back there. So she's, how'd you like your first Sunday without having to, yeah, that's a wonderful thing. I'm looking forward to that day again someday. My story's a little different. About six or seven years ago, six years ago, the Lord told me it was time for me to step down to the church I was leading. And the same thing, everything was great, no sickness, no disaster, no nothing. Well, I can't be it. And I just kind of resisted. And then the Lord gave me a, a, a one notification, another notification, another, things that only God could do in my life. And it just was starting to add up, add up, add up. Finally, number eight on the list uh, was a, a near-death experience. I was with a buddy. We were in South Texas, oil trucks everywhere. We're driving down this little skinny road. Truck falls, a guy falls asleep, hits a oil, a diesel a crude tanker. Boom, things go up. And I remember sitting in the driver's seat of my buddy's truck, seeing this big old truck tire in slow motion. You know, they say that happens. It does. And I'm thinking, oh, this is going to hurt. It hits the ground, bounces over our truck, Truck's demolished, the, the oil tanker goes off into the woods, doesn't blow up, misses a tree by a foot. We go and we, land, we get in the ditch, didn't get a scratch on his truck. And, uh, and I remember telling my friend, I said, how's exciting? And he's all shook up. He said, that stuff always happens to you. It doesn't happen to me. I said, well, the angels watch out for us. But the Lord reminded me, he said, this is number eight on the list. You could have died and then who would be leading the church? I said, I got it. <laughs> Basically, the Lord said, would you like cancer? No, sir, I got the plan. <laughs> the accident's enough. And so that began my journey of the process. Life's been good. Moved before Collins, hanging out with my granddaughter and my son and daughter-in-law. And about a month ago, I was well, three, months, no, three weeks ago, a month ago, actually it was a month ago tonight, I was watching Sunday night football and was just praying. You can pray and watch Sunday night football at the same time. <laughs> Your team's losing, you do pray a lot for them, but uh, that's going to happen today, I'm afraid. To the, anyway, the Broncos and the Chiefs, but that's not, that's not important. So I'm praying. I just said, Lord, I'm willing to walk through any doors that you open up. That's a nice, bold, good Christian prayer. I'll, I'll walk through whatever you open up. And the answer the Lord gave me back, and it wasn't one of these, Robert. It was, you know, when you're praying and he puts the thought in your mind. When I said, I'll walk through any door you open up. And the Lord said, well, you haven't been jiggling any doorknobs lately. Well, that's true. What's been, you know, COVID, we've all been locked up. Things have all changed. And he said, you haven't knocked on any doors. You haven't jiggled any handles. So I just got my little iPad and opened it up to Indeed.com for no reason other than I saw the commercial. I just text Pastor Jobs in Fort Collins, Colorado. One pops up. Part-time lead pastor, the Grove Church, Fort Collins. Now, the very phrase, part-time lead pastor, sure did catch my attention. <laughs> That's nice, not eight to five, Monday through Friday and every Sunday for the rest of your life, part-time, nice church plant, looked it up, look at the pictures, watch the story, I thought, wow, that would be really cool. And then uh, followed up with it. The next step was to respond. Now, this was on Indeed.com. And then I talked to Billy Wilson, and then I met with uh, Julie and, and Nicole. We had a really nice lunch. Anyway, four, month, four weeks ago, I said, Lord, I'm willing to walk through any doors you open up. Today, one month later, here I am is the lead pastor for the Grove Church. God is good. God has an eternal plan for your life. Not always easy. Not always fun. He never gives us the whole thing and tells us what's going to happen. He just says, here's the next step. Take it. If you take it, God keeps showing it to you. If you stop, if you hesitate, if you say, eh, if you start making excuses, the Lord says, take your time. I've got all of eternity. You have 70 years. You get in on God's plan. You do what it is he is revealing for you to do. And he takes, shows you the next step. Interesting thing, the miraculous, the divine part of this whole story is that neither Julie nor Nicole nor Billy, nobody posted the church, the, the pastor job on Indeed. I've never been to Indeed. I go there, here it is, and here we are today. You say, wow, that's a pretty cool story. That's what God does for every one of his children who says, Lord, show me your will, open the door, and I will walk through it. That's our journey at this point. I don't know where it's going from here, but I know God's in charge. So every day, Lord, thank you for today. 
make me a blessing to people and show me your will one day, one step at a time. What did Jesus say? Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. There's enough challenges in today to keep you busy. God wants us walking in the present, and that's what we're doing. Now, that's our story, Julie's and mine. What's yours? What's going on in your life today, this week, this month? Anybody in this room or online going through a major life plan? Is the job you were counting on going to work at January the 2nd suddenly non-existent? All of a sudden, you're without a job? Are you pregnant, not married? Or you got a spot or a bump and it turns out to be cancer? Or you got issues going on in your life? You go, yes, what do I do? Follow Mary, the mother of Jesus. You think through it. You get through that initial shock. And then you say, okay, Lord, what's my next step? Who do I talk to? What do I read? Where do I go? Where do I start? Where do I stop? God will answer those prayers. And then when he shows you, you say, all right. And you call that person up. You get the book. You read it. You do whatever it is God tells you to do. God has an eternal plan. It's not always easy, and it's not always fun, but it is always eternal. Get in on it as fast as you can, and you will discover the highest and best life that God has for you. Let's pray together.